Hi guys. Jenny is going to be joining us shortly. <gasps> there she is. Hi. Sorry if I'm a little late. <laughs> no. Listen, I'm just trying to get my thing situated. I somehow moved it, but didn't know that I moved it. No, I love your lipstick, though. Thank you, KKW. <laughs> my favorite. Oh. I got something inside it. Okay. Hi, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Happy third night of Hanukkah, if anyone is celebrating. Oh. Mm -hmm. I have um, some hot chocolate spiked with white chocolate liqueur. Oh. For anyone interested, let us know what you're eating, drinking, whatever. And I have a Bob's Burgers mug. Don't have a crap attack. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I have some hard apple cider today. One of my favorite go-to simple drinks anytime that I'm trying to relax, which is definitely the fill for tonight. I love apple cider of any kind. <laughs> hard <laughs> I definitely, definitely agree. Um, yay, we have people joining us. I hope you guys are having a great Saturday. This week went by so fast, I have to say. Yeah. Hi, Marissa. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, moms. <laughs> Thank <laughs> and you. Hi, hi to my mom, too, who's oh, joining yeah. us this hi, week. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate it. Yes, and you know, just our general disclaimer that it's going to be some explicit language um, in this and that everything is allegedly, everything is just, you know, things that we've researched and that we've read on this subject um, and, you know, our opinion. So don't sue us. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know what you think, too, if you have any theories going into this or after we talk a little bit. I think this is one of, like, the most popular American conspiracy theories. I don't know if it was 2013 or 2003, but there's been different polls done since um, John F. Kennedy's death. And 70% of Americans believe that there was some kind of plot to kill him. Um, and 51% of Americans believe that there was more than one gunman. Yep. So definitely things we'll talk about tonight. Absolutely. And this is one of my favorite ones. So I guess we shouldn't barely lead anymore. Um, we're going to be covering the John F. Kennedy assassination and also just looking in general about this concept of a Kennedy curse, which is the concept that that family is just everything bad seems to happen to them um, at least once a year um, for the duration of them being in power. So just to let you know, for the people that don't know, the Kennedy family is an American political family, and it's been super prominent in politics, public service, entertainment, and business. Uh, the first Kennedy to hold public office was Patrick Kennedy, and that was in 1884. And this was 35 years after the family immigrated from Ireland. They're super proud of their heritage and you know you can look at a lot of their names a lot of their policies trace back to their motherland and just a fun fact at least one kennedy member has held federal office every year from 1947 up until 2011 so that just shows you the power they've gone through multiple generations of you know being in public service and really having a lot of influence over what happens in the lives of Americans, especially. But they also have a lot of business power, which means they affect the lives of everyone. They're probably like what people would consider American royalty, too. Very wealthy, very high status, very well respected. Absolutely. And it's weird because typically as Americans, we kind of look down on royalty, like, mm, that's not us. We like it from afar. Like, you know, I, I love the, the queen. Real wedding. <laughs> yeah, like, I love the queen for England, like, not for us. So 
JFK, um, and you'll notice that we're going to be using a lot of initials just because that's how they're typically referred to. So just, you know, in the chat, if you're like, mm, I don't know who that initial stands for, just let us know. And I can definitely always clarify as we go through. But um, JFK is definitely a very famous uh, acronym. So JFK was the 35th president. And he actually won the presidency against Nixon. Tricky dick. Um, I was watching, when I was researching, I rewatched a couple of videos. And one of them, the guy had called him Tricky Dick. And that was just, I'm like, I need to refer to him as Tricky Dick at least one time um, mm -hmm. in, in this thing because I love it so much. Um, he beat Nixon. And a lot of people say that he beat Nixon because it was the first debate that was televised and if you see um, JFK, you'll see that he's a very attractive man um, by any standards, especially by the 1960s standards. <laughs> and um, Nixon, uh, he had a face for radio. Let's, <laughs> let's just say that. Um, so people, like he was sweating profusely, uh, Richard Nixon was. And so they say that the debate happening on TV really helped um, JFK be elected. And they also say he may have helped, had the help of the mafia, but we'll talk about that a little later. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so he served from January 1961 until his assassination in November of 1963. And he was actually the first Catholic that was president. And it's so weird to think because you were like 35th president, you're just getting your first Catholic one. Well, I mean, it took 44 to get your first black one. So that doesn't surprise me too often about this country and, um, its ability to really try to weed people out. So what did Kennedy do? I mean, he was only in office for two years, but he really um, helped with the establishment of the Peace Corps, trying to open up communication to Latin America. And he made sure that the Apollo Space Program was fully funded. Um, and it was the program that led to having a man on the moon. Um, he also worked to sign the first nuclear weapons treaty in October of 1964, which was only a month before he was killed. So then the question remains, why did he go to Dallas? <laughs> you know, that is probably one of the biggest questions that people ask, because had he not gone to Dallas, he probably wouldn't have been killed. So Kennedy decided he needed to go to Dallas because Lyndon B. Johnson, <laughs> Lyndon Baines Johnson, LBJ, who was a Texas... Another acronym. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So he couldn't hold the fort down in Texas. The, let's just call it spade to spade. He couldn't hold the fort down. Mm -hmm. And Kennedy had to go to make sure that Texas was still going to vote um, for him in his reelection bid. And we'll talk more about LBJ and how he may have played a role in this assassination a little later. But one thing I do want to note was Kennedy's last words. So at around 1230 um, Texas time, Nellie, um, who was the first lady of Texas, she turned to Kennedy and she said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. And he replied, no, you certainly can't, which is really weird considering, you know, Dallas was the reason why he died. So before we get into the nitty gritty about the assassination and get into the magic bullet theory, Jenny, <laughs> What is one of the most fascinating aspects um, of this case for you? I think the fact that we have this on film might be one of the most fascinating things. It's, I don't know if anyone is familiar, probably if you are with the JFK assassination, but the Zabruder tape, um, Abraham Zabruder was a man that was just in the crowd seeing the motorcade drive by through the streets of Dallas. Um, and he caught JFK being shot on camera. Um, and you can find it out there if you are sensitive to that kind of material. I would maybe shy away from it. I know I personally am very sensitive to that. And images like that really stick with me. Um, but the fact that we have this on tape is so crazy. I feel like that's one of the first, like, you know, we had, um, like, Abe Lincoln get assassinated, but this was like something big. We were moving into like the TV age and the modern age. And to have that on film is really interesting. I also, I mean, I guess we'll, I don't want to really get too much into my theory, but the fact that it really could have been stopped 
too. Um, I don't know if before we want to talk, really get into the nitty gritty, but the Secret Service went to Dallas and this route that the president was on was very windy. It had a lot of turns. It wasn't just like a straightforward route, which I guess would have been a normal thing at the time. Um, and the Secret Service noted that there were like 20,000 windows on the route that JFK would be driving down. And they didn't investigate any of the windows because they weren't fully staffed, I guess. But I mean, that just goes to show how like everyone at every level half asses things, I guess. I mean, it's the president. You wouldn't right. think maybe you want to get there like a week ahead of time and like scope everything out to see what's going on. And I, this was also during the Cold War. So tensions were kind of high. People were very scared. I don't know. You'd think that this would be like a perfect opportunity for someone to assassinate him. And that's exactly what happened. Right. And you're so right with the Secret Service just dropping the ball when it came to this. So something else that was flagged was the fact that the FBI was actually, they had um, Oswald on their, you know, not wanted list, but their, you know, to look out for list. And they didn't share that with um, the Secret Service, even though he worked at um, a business along the route, the Texas School Book Depository. But it was also that the Secret Service didn't tell them that they were going to be going by there. So it was kind of both of them not communicating with each other and not being able to actually release all the information that they could have had. And so then you had him getting shot. So before we get into the, what I'm phrasing, the accepted version of events, I um, want to let you know where this version came from, and that was the Warren Commission. So it's technically called the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, and it was established by LBJ through an executive order um, about a week after the assassination. And it's called the Warren Commission because the head of it was the Supreme Court Justice Earl Warren, and they released a 888-page report about what they thought happened. So these, <laughs> this following events, it's not conclusive. It's not 100% like this is what happened. This is just what the Warren Commission said happened. So they maintained that only three bullets were fired. The first one missed. The second one was the magic bullet. And the third one was the one that fatally struck uh, Kennedy. So to walk you through this magic bullet theory, they call it a single bullet theory, but it, it's magical when you think about what it was literally able to do. So this second shot <laughs> was able to go through Kennedy, right? Exit Kennedy, go through Connolly once, then go through him twice, lodge in his thigh, and remain intact despite going through two humans. And mind you, the other bullets, they weren't intact. The one that missed wasn't intact, and the one that uh, fatally wounded JFK wasn't intact. That, that's just craziness. Um yeah, and Connolly, um, for those that don't know, he was the governor of Texas at the time, and he and his wife were in the same vehicle as Jackie <clears throat> and JFK, as well as, I don't know, I guess it was Secret Service people and whoever was driving. So yeah, like Dell said, it went through JFK's neck, I believe, or like, yeah, in his neck, through him to the governor. And this bullet magically stayed intact. I believe they found the bullet on a stretcher that Connolly was on once he was like getting medical attention. And they assumed it was this bullet. And you could, there's pictures of it too. And it looks yeah. beautiful, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of those things where, listen, I'm not a gun expert. I'm not going to pretend to be a gun expert. But it's kind of weird to me that this bullet remained intact despite going through humans and causing damage. It wasn't a thing where, you know, it went through this magic spot on the human body and didn't encounter much. No, it went through flesh and it ca caused, a, you know, doctors have said that it caused a wound that would have caused significant harm to Kennedy. Um, 
you know, even if it wasn't for that third shot that actually struck him in the head. So this wasn't just a grazing wound that happened to him. But again, only three bullets being fired was what was accepted by the Warren Commission, but many have posited that there was more than one shooter and there was more shots being fired. So one guy, uh, James, James Taig, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, he said that he was actually grazed by a bullet and he was sure that it was the second bullet that was fired. Mind you, the first bullet missed. So if it was the first bullet, it would make sense if it grazed him. But he is so sure that it was the second bullet. And when looking at the, Zabu mm, the Zabuter film, it's, they're certain that uh, Oswald didn't have enough time to actually fire off two bullets in that time. So... Hmm. That brings up the grassy knoll. And <laughs> the grassy knoll is one of those words that I love saying because it's one of those concepts that don't make sense to me, at least outside of the JFK assassination. So the grassy knoll was actually a plot of grass that Kennedy rolled by. And many people have said that that's where the second shooter was. And this second shooter can be a part of many different organizations that we're going to get into. But the simple premise is the fact that from that position, whether they were laying down in the grass or whether they were taking a knee, they fired shots that struck at least the governor, if not struck Kennedy as well. And that and James Tig, oh, sorry, Del, to cut you uh -huh. off. James Tig, he was just like in the crowd watching, right? And he yeah. got like some aftermath, I guess, by the second bullet. Um, I don't know if we want to mention Lee Harvey Oswald now or yeah. we want to wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's go into him because he's a very okay. important part of this. You know, you don't have the JFK assassination without him, even if you look at the theories that posit that he didn't act alone. So the Warren Commission and all other official governmental commissions have ruled that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone and that he fired three shots from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Now, just a little background on him. He was a former U.S. Marine sharpshooter, which is why they posited that he would be able to fire off the, sh the shots at the distance, though it doesn't make sense that he would miss that first shot if he was a sharpshooter. Um, and he was actually a communist and a Soviet Union, now Russia, sympathizer. So that definitely lends credence to the fact that he didn't like the United States and that he wanted to do some disruption to get back at JFK for his policy regarding the Soviet Union. He was also a pretty violent person. Um, I don't know if he had assaulted or shot people in the past, but leading up to um, JFK's death, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald did have a criminal record. Yeah, so I remember reading one story where he attacked his brother's stepbrother, something like that, with a book, causing him to bleed. Like, that's how you know bad he beat him so he was definitely not someone who was you know jolly go lucky and a you know a great person to be around and i wish we could tell you more about him but unfortunately two days after jfk's assassination he was shot dead by jack ruby and why he was shot dead is definitely questions that i have for you know a lot of powerful people yeah, um, Jack Ruby also has um, some gang mafia affiliations. Um, he was a nightclub owner in Dallas. And I think one of the official reasons for why he shot Lee Harvey Oswald was because he was just so distraught with emotion for the president dying. Um, and we also have video footage of this. And please watch it. I, for one, think it looks completely staged. Just the way he like kind of hobbles in through the crowd, bang, bang, in the stomach, Lee Harvey Oswald's dead, and everyone is just like, oh no, he's been shot. It's very, it's bizarre. And I know that we're looking at this from a modern lens too, but you'd think someone that just shot the president, maybe they would try to like protect him a little more and not just let some random person in a crowd at like the back of the police station get to him that easily right 
And it was like they were holding him up for a show. And keep in mind that Oswald is also a cop killer. Um, 45 minutes after the assassination, he killed Dallas police um, officer J.D. Tippett. So this wasn't just someone who assassinated a president, tried to kill a governor, um, attempted murder of the first lady of Texas and the first lady of the United States. He was also a cop killer. And one thing that you always see when it comes to cop killers is that the cops don't play around. They're like, we want to find this guy. We need to get this guy. They definitely go a lot harder with the investigation. So the fact that they were also this free willy-nilly with a cop killer, that doesn't make much sense to me. I'm like, okay, what, what were you doing? Like, were you holding him? Waiting for this to happen? I'm just asking questions. Like the disclaimer mm-hmm. says, everything is allegations. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, but- so many questions with this case. And we do have some answers, which I'm sure we'll talk about a little later on, but lots of speculation. <laughs> yeah, so now let's get into if it wasn't just Oswald. If he wasn't a crazed madman just wanting to attack a president because he was a communist, who else could have been? Who else was helping him in this operation? And the first one is Russia. It's the simplest one. Um, Like we said, Oswald, he was a communist. He was sympathetic to the Soviet Union's cause. And so the Russia theory posits that Oswald was actually a KGB operative and that he was sent by the Soviet Union to kill JFK to disrupt the United States. As you know, killing a president is always something that causes a reaction. And so the theory says that Russia wanted that strong reaction so that they were able to gain state secrets and other things that would help them in the Cold War um, and also the race to the moon. So it was both of those things working in tandem with each other. And also, actually, he tried to give up his American citizenship and defect to the Soviet Union. That didn't work, but he was actually at the Russian embassy in Mexico City about two or three weeks before the assassination. Um, and I find that to be really odd. Like, why were you there? Yeah, and the CIA knows for a fact he was there and who he was talking to. Um, There's also some video footage of Lee Harvey Oswald, like, out on the street handing out, like, communist, like, information to people, which, like, what a coincidence is that, that, like, of all, that someone had this on film, and then this is also the guy responsible, responsible for killing the president? I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) you know, it's all very suspicious. And once again, we can't ask him any questions. You know, it's the thing of all he said on before he was killed was that he was a patsy and that he didn't do it. That's the only thing he said. But there's clear evidence such as his fingerprints, you know, on the shell casings. The shell casings actually match the bullets that, you know, struck Kennedy and Connolly. So there is evidence that he... Um, actually killed him. The question is, did he act alone? Who financed the operation? Things like that. Because he's not someone that was able to hold down a job for a long period of time. He did have a job at the time of the assassination. But the rifles and the uh, bullets that he used were not cheap. And so the question is, how was he able to afford the type of weaponry that he had to carry out the assassination? It just didn't make sense to a lot of people that are experts in firearms. Like, you know, how did you afford that? And one possible answer to that is our next group of suspects, and that's the mafia. Um, So specifically the Miami, New Orleans, and Chicago mob. And This traces back to just a couple different things. So one, it's alleged that the Kennedy family had a connection to the Chicago mob, specifically, make sure I get his name right, Sam Giacana and Joseph Kennedy were said to have some relationship in bootlegging. And then it was alleged that JFK and Giacana actually shared a mistress, which I love that addition to it. Everyone knows JFK was a womanizer and he had so many different mistresses, probably couldn't count them all. But the fact that he was sharing a mistress with uh, a mobster, mm, I don't think that is coincidence. And like Jenny said, it was alleged that Jack Ruby had some 
mafia ties. Um, I know you think that the mafia had something big to do with the JFK assassination, Jenny. I do think so, but then, I don't know. I think, like, as we're talking now, I do think it could be Oswald and someone else. But there is, I think, good evidence to point to the mob. I mean, I think it's weird that, like, three different groups would be like, yeah, we did it. But <laughs> we know that um, Robert F. Kennedy, um, JFK's brother, and who was also serving as the attorney general. Um, is that right, Del? Yep. Okay, so he was serving as the attorney general, and he was making moves on really cracking down on organized crime. So you could think of this as, you know, a way for them to get revenge, like, oh, you're going to try to mess with us, we'll show you what happens when you mess with us. Also, um, the man, Sam Giacano, whatever his name is, who was kind of like friendly with JFK, he was also assassinated later on when he was supposed to be speaking about involvement in an assassination. Right. So more <laughs> craziness. <laughs> yeah. Like um, what a coincidence that it's about um in 1975 he was assassinated right before he was going to testify. Um because our next suspect, our next group of suspects is actually the CIA. And the CIA, listen. If the question is does the CIA kill people, the answer is yes. I that's record. If the question is, did the CIA orchestrate and carry out the assassination on President Kennedy? That's up in the air. But, <laughs> mm, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't be out of the realm. So the CIA actually, um, was, people were already suspicious of them, but they actually came under more scrutiny because they withheld information from the Warren Commission. So, and it was weird because the CIA director... Um, Alan Dunn's Doles, he was actually on the Warren Commission. So it was like, mm, what's going on? Why are you withholding information? And apparently they claimed that they withheld it because of national security. They knew the commission would be releasing the report with all the evidence and they didn't want it to get out. And allegedly it has something to do with Lee um, Harvey Oswald's activities while he was in Mexico City. Um, apparently he was connecting with the Russia counter espionage um, person, so a spy, and they didn't want that information released, so they orchestrated this whole hit. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Bay of Pigs incident, um, but allegedly JFK was very upset about that, and he rearranged the CIA and restructured it in a way that the CIA didn't like because it caused them to lose power and lose resources. So that's another reason why they wanted to kill him. I think um, the CIA was also kind of worried that JFK would disband the CIA as well. I've heard theories of that. Um, like Del said, they withheld some information and there's actually a second, um, I think, guess this is like fact it's not alleged there's a second video taken that shows um the assassination from a different angle and that does show the grassy knoll that we mentioned that the second shooter could possibly have been on and that was lost somehow video footage of the president dying that i'm sure was given to these agencies maybe the cia it was lost somehow how does that happen you'd think you'd keep that under lock and key like the safest place in the world you'd think would be with these like intelligence officers or someone, some, you know, organization. So that I kind of, I don't know if it's directly tied to them, but I feel like it doesn't help their case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely doesn't help their case. Yeah. Um, I want to say it's called like the JFK conspiracy film. Like that's what they retitled it because it suspiciously just went missing. They said that it was given to the Warren Commission and then the select commission, the select committee on assassinations that covered both the JFK assassination, the Robert F. Kennedy assassination, and the Martin Luther King Jr. assassinations. They also saw the film and they testified to what was on it, but then 
it just went missing. And in 2011 or 2012, the um, daughter or granddaughter of the person that actually took that film sued the federal government for like $10 million in order to try to get the film back. And they keep saying that it's lost. And I doubt that they're making any efforts to find it because it allegedly contains proof that there was a second shooter. So some people who have seen the film have testified to seeing um, gun smoke coming from the grassy knoll and seeing a flash of light and one uh, theory and this is actually seen in the um, Zabuter film is the Umbrella Man and I love him I do I love the idea of some guy killing another person with an umbrella it's fascinating to me although it may not hold as much weight as I wish it did so in the film um, as JFK is going by you see a man with an umbrella and then he opens it up and then shots get fired. The same man then sits down on the curb with another man like nothing is happening. Like they're just cool as a cucumber which is really weird because you see a bunch of people running and like panicking like whoa someone got shot bullets are being fired. So it's that general panic that happens and they're just calm as a cucumber. So the man came forward and his name was Louis Stephen Witt. He claims to be the Umbrella Man. There's no proof. Um, he he supposedly he's just a guy that came forward. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> he was like, "This is me. This is the exact umbrella." Which, I mean, a black umbrella like you can go any to any store in this country and buy a black umbrella. I don't. I'm sure you could still do that in the '60s too, but. Come on, dude. <laughs> right. And so he weaves this magical story of this black umbrella that it was a sign of protest against uh, JFK's father and uh, JFK's father's appeasement to Nazi and Nazism. Um, he said that he used the umbrella because it was the signature accessory of Neville Chamberlain, who was the um, former prime minister of England who famously appeased Hitler to the point where Hitler was able to build up his military. And a lot of historians posit that if it wasn't for the appeasement of Neville Chamberlain, Hitler may not have been able to do what he did. Um, and Neville Chamberlain wasn't the only country that was appeasing Hitler at all, but um, they just used him because he was seen as the most powerful person that was able to help Hitler I don't want to say help, but um, not stand in Hitler's way of getting what he wanted. And unfortunately, of course, we all know that that was a very racist and anti-Semitic thing. So, um, and umbrellas were used as a form of protest. It wasn't like unheard of, but it's still really weird to me that you just had an umbrella on a non-rainy day. Um, and you just happened to open it at the time that the president was um, strolling on by. Yeah, I mean, I will say I've never been to Texas, but I know that it can get kind of hot there. And if it was like a nice sunny day, maybe the man did just kind of want like some shield from the sun. I was in New Orleans like last, sometime last year. And it was so hot that I had to use an umbrella to like show myself from the sun. And I've never experienced that before. So it could very well be that it is just strange though, that there's pictures of the man having the umbrella down and then it's up as soon as JFK passes. I think you said that down and then it comes right back down. Weird. He also said too, that he kind of didn't know what was going on because his umbrella was up. So he didn't physically see him JFK get shot. So he was just kind of like, Oh, like, what's going on? But I don't know if I would just sit down. I'm sure people were like, oh, my God, he just got shot. Like, right. you don't have to just, like, witness that yourself to, you know, this crowd hysteria that was going on. People would be freaking out all over the place. And you can see in those pictures, people look terrified. Right. Exactly. It's so weird because... You look at it, and I don't know about you guys, but when people are freaking out around me, I freak out too, because I'm like, if you're freaking out, you're not doing it because you're putting on a show. You're freaking out because some shit is going down, and you're like, you need to get out of Dodge. And I'm pretty sure, like you said, people were screaming, the president's dead, the president's dead, oh my freaking gosh. <laughs> um, so you're going to tell me that's happening, and you're just like, and you can watch the film. He's so calm. Like him and the other guy are just like, 
hey <laughs> yeah just a not rainy day and i still have an umbrella how you doing like that's mm-hmm. that's the general um disposition that you get from him and yeah it's one of the weirdest theories that um that is within this case because it's like how can you be so calm and you know if you were a you know assassin that was sent you would think that you would be better at blending in and he clearly really stands out with that umbrella and you know being calm as a cucumber as someone's brain is literally blown out of their freaking head yeah and there may be a reason for why he was really standing out um so part Part of this Umbrella Man theory is that he was a CIA agent in disguise, and opening the umbrella was either a signal to someone to shoot the president, or opening the umbrella would have caused, like, darts to come out and shoot the president. Um, And the darts would be, like, lined in the webbing of the umbrella, and we know this because the man who, I don't know if it's alleged or if he definitely did create it, this man that created it was like, yeah, I created it, and this is how this umbrella weapon works. So (laughs) it's kind of like, I don't know, like we always think of like the CIA and like spies and like, this is like James Bond level stuff. We think of all these like crazy weapons that exist and it adds, I mean, this could be true if (laughs) this guy is, you know, if he's the real deal, this stuff does exist. And it does definitely add kind of a layer of like excitement to the case as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the guy definitely said like he had a prototype and everything that he was able to test out. So yeah, like you said, it's really a James Bond spy thing. But I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, art really copies reality in some ways so it could be a thing of um a lot of those weapons and um you know projectiles that we see on movies they're just getting it from like cia files that they were able to get um and speaking of just really weird but may have some meat on it type conspiracy the last person that may have been responsible for jfk's death was well his own vice president um Lyndon B. Johnson, LBJ um himself. And this theory is based off what LBJ gained from Kennedy's assassination. Um, as you all know, he's the vice president. So Kennedy dies, it's automatic, it's noble, it's nothing he has to do, he becomes president. And he even tried to take the Democratic nomination away from JFK. He was unable to, and so he became the vice president. But there was rumors that they may have wanted to take him off the ticket. Because like we were talking about earlier, he was actually not in political control of Texas anymore. And Texas was super important. And the reason why he was on the ticket was to secure the Texas vote. Um, and he said that he was bored of being vice president and he viewed it as an emasculated position with no real power, especially when compared to the fact that he was the majority leader in the U S Senate, which is what Mitch McConnell does now. And as you guys know from that, that is a really powerful position. So to go from that to being the vice president, I can definitely understand why he felt like I'm not really doing anything. I'm literally here just in case what happens you know, to the president. That's the only reason why we have a vice president. And in this case, I can definitely see why he would be like, I don't, I don't want this. Um, But it's a weird wrinkle in this case that I love um, because it involved his alleged mistress, um, Madeline Brown. And she claims that there was a meeting between LBJ Richard Nixon, yes, that Richard Nixon. And the F- we love talking about him. The second week we've talked about Tricky Dick. Yes. And also someone who we haven't brought up yet, but it's full of some really good shit. And that's the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover. Um, and if you know anything about him, he loves to have his Queen Pauls and everything. I love him so much. Um, so allegedly at this meeting... LBJ said, after tomorrow, those Kennedys will never embarrass me again. That's no threat. That's a promise. And he said this the day before the assassination. Is is that not on point or what, Jenny? Yeah, very 
on the news, <laughs> some may say. Um, and a lot of people, I mean, I guess it was kind of proven that there was no secret meeting or party between the three because of, was LBJ with JFK the night before? Right. There yes. was something that happened the night before that disproves um, whatever Madeline Brown's story. Yeah. So LBJ actually was in Texas the day before the assassination. He was, you know, doing the Texas circuit, um, as they phrase it. And his uh, movements were heavily scrutinized, heavily documented, um, because, of course, they were trying to gear up for re-election. So, yeah, there was no way that this meeting happened. Nixon's whereabouts are accounted for. Uh, you know, my boy Jay Eggers' whereabouts were accounted for. Everything was accounted for. Um, she's lying. Now, whether she was his actual mistress, there is some evidence for that. But there's no real evidence that this meeting actually happened. It's fiction. Um, it's good fiction. You know, it's like um, <laughs> it Stephen is. King. But, <laughs> you know, it didn't happen. So as we, you know, move into the last 15 minutes or so, we would be remiss not to bring up the Kennedy curse. And the Kennedy curse, again, is just this concept that bad shit happens to the Kennedys. And bad shit has been happening to the Kennedys for as almost as long as they've been in the public eye. And it, I'm not going to, I literally cannot mention everything that has happened. But there is just a couple things that just spring up to mind when a lot of people hear this. And the first one is the lobotomy of Rosemary Kennedy in November of 1941. She was having seizures. She was having a lot of other problems. And so Joseph, really not understanding, and medicine wasn't as advanced as it needed to be, especially for mental health issues, as we frequently talk about um, on the podcast. So they did a lobotomy on her and it permanently incapacitated her and she was unable to speak um, in any real capacity. And the family was actually shunned from her. Um, so she was stationed, like, unfortunately, away from her family. And then finally, luckily, later in her life, um, after Joseph Kennedy died, the family was able to be reunited with her and have some sort of connection with her. I've heard Joseph Kennedy um, was kind of like a pusher with his kids. He really pushed them to be the best, do everything they could. He also kind of instilled in them that they were better than everyone else. So I'm sure having a daughter that had some type of, you know, neurological disorder was not in his plan. Right. And unfortunately, that's not something new. That's something that we see a lot where parents don't accept the, the you know, the quote unquote deficiencies that they call it in their children and they do anything. And in this case, he took what could have been a manageable medical condition and he turned it into something that really altered her life um, for the worse. Mm -hmm. So um, some other things are, you know, Poor Ted Kennedy. Um, or not for Ted well, Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So two things happened to this man, which is why I started to say poor. And then I remember the second one was his fault because he was drunk. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about the first one, which is the plane crash that happened on June 19th, 1964. And so he was on his way to Massachusetts to accept a nomination for the full term in the Senate. Um, at their convention and his plane went down and he ended up having a um, three vertebrae broken and two ribs, a collapsed lung. It was really bad. It was really touch and go. Um, and people didn't know whether he was going to survive. And mind you, this was about eight, nine months after um, his brother's assassination. So the family was still mourning. So, it, you know, tragedy always you know, truncates itself, it always adds to itself, and unfortunately for the Kennedy family, they really get no reprieve. Um, because then it was Robert Kennedy's assassination in June 6th of 1968. Um, he was killed by a Palestinian man named Saram Saram when he was um, accepting the California um, 
nomination for president. He had won the Democratic primary. And he was going through the kitchen. He went to stop to shake a young boy's hand. And Saran Saran killed him. Um, he shot him. He survived for about 26 hours and died later at the hospital. And one of the tragic parts about this is his wife was actually two months pregnant. Um, with their child when he died. Um, and you may have heard of his son, who is now an anti-vaxxer. So unfortunately, his name is just getting dragged through the mud when it comes to that. Um, and then we circle back to Ted Kennedy, because then the car crash happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, what year was that? I don't have it up in my notes. Sorry, everyone. I'm looking over to check my notes we like to get facts right on this podcast <laughs> absolutely so the car crash happened on july 18th 1969 yes he was in Chippaquiddick, massachusetts um driving with a young woman um and they got into a car accident and the car went into the water right del yep he hit the bridge um, on the property. It was one of those weird freak accidents, but not an accident because, like I said, he was drunk. Um, they had just came back from a party, and um, he had her in a passion seat, and he survived, but she did end up dying, and she was 28 at the time, and she was trapped in a vehicle. And one thing that people really... Um, they held his feet to the fire because um, it seemed like no attempts were made to free her from the vehicle. And it actually cost him any presidential aspirations that he had. Um, quite frankly, it should have cost him a lot more, but he is a Kennedy. And this was in Massachusetts, which has always been a Kennedy stronghold. Yeah, he um, he claims that he did try to save her, but he kind of knew he couldn't do anything. And I don't know if he was putting his own life at risk. That's what he says. Um, but she did end up dying, unfortunately. There have been, like, documentaries and movies made about this instance. I don't, I haven't seen them, but I'd really like to. I do think it's fascinating. He served, what was it, like, senator, governor? He was in um, political power in Massachusetts. Like Del said, um, the family has a stronghold there. That's kind of where the, the Kennedy compound is. It's where they're all from. Right. So, yeah, he was the U.S. senator for Massachusetts for, um, I want to get this right. Let me look at, it was a 19. So for about 30 years, um, 30, 35 years until his death, uh, he was the U.S. Senator. And it, um, his seat is actually the seat that Elizabeth Warren um, is uh, in occupation of now. Um, you know, a lot of things were said because it went Republican first and they were like, whoa, I can't believe that a Republican, Scott Brown, has this seat. And then it switched back to... Um, Democrat with a lovely person in Elizabeth Warren. So <laughs> we can trust them to go blue now. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm just going to quickly rattle off some other things and then get to the next big one. So you had an overdose um, of David Kennedy in April 25th of 1984. You had Michael Kennedy's skiing accident in December 31st of 1997. You had the rape trial of William Kennedy Smith in April 1st of 1991. And then on July 16th, 1991, you had the plane crash that killed John F. Kennedy Jr. It also killed his wife, Carolyn Bassett, and his sister-in-law, his sister-in-law, Lauren Bassett. And um, this, the, um, want to get this, the National Transportation Safety Board rule that um, he wasn't flying in the right conditions and that he had some um, spatial disorientation that caused him to crash into the water. And unfortunately, they didn't survive. And it's really sad because he definitely had a promising life ahead of him. He was doing super good in business and he was also um, set up to do a political run. That was definitely in his future. And you'll see that a lot of times these tragedies end up taking the Kennedys out of political power. So if you look at losing the presidency, you have losing another possible president in both Robert Kennedy and in Ted Kennedy. And then you have um, John F. Kennedy Jr. also um, dying as a result of a plane crash. Um, we also had more drug overdoses. And this thing, like I said, is not a thing that is foreign. Um, and it's not a thing that, you know, time has really solved. 
because on April 2nd, 2020, um, Mauve, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name correct, Kennedy McKean, she actually drowned with her eight-year-old son, Gideon. Um, they were paddling um, in Sunnyside, Maryland. They had went there when COVID was really starting and getting um, increased in impact. And so they went there for what was supposed to be a safe haven. Um, and unfortunately, both of them passed away. And the medical examiner reported that it was an accidental drowning due to the turbulence of the Chesapeake Bay um, and also how cold the water was. So she just wasn't able to... Um, she wasn't able to save her son. And unfortunately, there was several drownings um, this year. I know um, a wrestler, Chad Gaspar, um, had passed away. A Glee actress, I want to say her name is Naya. Um, Naya Rivera, yeah. Naya Rivera, she also yeah. passed. So, you know, the Kennedy curse is one of those things where I think there's some credence to it. What do you think, Jenny? I think so, too. I know I've seen that the Kennedys don't believe they are cursed. Um, I mean, I, I feel like if all this stuff was happening to my family, I probably would. And there are theories behind this curse. So there's some theories that um, I don't know the exact story. I was trying to find it earlier. But there's a theory that Joseph Kennedy upset a rabbi um, on board some kind of cruise ship I believe and the rabbi was upset and cursed the family and then there's also theories too going way back to when the family was still in Ireland that they did so they'd like disturbed a fairy hill which is I guess like an area where fairies live and the fairies like cursed the family so that's definitely like some Irish folklore I think I don't know if all fairies are bad within Irish folklore or just some but these ones, I guess, weren't like the cute, like Tinkerbell kind of fairies that <laughs> we usually think of, you know, with storybooks and stuff for kids. Um, it's weird stuff. It, it makes you think. And I mean, there are so many of them. Like, I know JFK was one of 11 kids, but then of the, or one of nine, I guess, it, I think it was one of nine. And of those nine kids, I think only like three of them didn't have something terrible happen to them. Right. And the weirdest thing, if something bad didn't happen to them directly, it happened to their kids. It was it's like yeah. one of those weird, you know, you know how they say eye color can skip a generation where apparently being in a catastrophic accident when you're Kenny <laughs> might skip you, but unfortunately go to your child or your grandchild. Um, Robert, Robert at Kennedy's, his uh, lineage is chalked full, unfortunately, of these circumstances. You had um, his granddaughter had a drug overdose. His son died. You had multiple um, plane crashes. And his, just in the Robert Kennedy side of things. So it, it's always weird. So Jenny, I just posted this last question to you. Sure. What are your final thoughts on the Kennedy assassination and what do you think we're going to find out when the rest of the documents get released? Are they definitely getting released? Like, do we know that? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> I kind of don't think that they will. I feel like there's going to be, they'll come out and they'll be like totally redacted, maybe to the point where we can't understand them. I don't know. I, I was going to ask you that, Ashley, like if you think we'll ever know what happened. And I kind of don't, or maybe in like a hundred years where... I don't know. I honestly feel like maybe like 10 days before the earth ends, like all these secrets are just going to come out. Perhaps. I don't know. Um, I do think that the CIA, CIA was definitely involved. And I do, I'm going to change my mind and say that I do think they were working with Oswald and they were using him somehow. Um, Fidel Castro actually believes the CIA was involved with the JFK assassination. Um, so which I thought was like a pretty interesting theory from him um I think that they were scared of what he could do to them and they knew that he represented someone different for the country that was not really going to put up with the bullshit that they wanted to do um JFK actually I don't know if you saw this though but a few weeks before his death he gave this speech on secret societies and like how we need to like we can't have secrets in this country and like we need to move past them. And I think that's so fascinating too. And it kind of brings me back like to Bohemian Grove yep. and this idea of a secret society. Um, and maybe, I don't know, was the CIA involved with that somehow? I don't know. It's a lot of questions, but 
like I said, I do think it's them. There's no way it was just Lee Harvey Oswald. I think like the timing disproves that all four people that were in the car or other people in the car with him said that there was no way it was just the one bullet. Like none of them remember it happening. Right. I mean, the, one of the other guys that was shot said that's not <laughs> what happened. Like, I think I would trust him. And a secret service agent was saying that too. I think he said like, there was like a barrage of bullets coming at us. Right. No, I absolutely agree with you. I think that the CIA definitely has something to do with it. And I do think that Oswald, he fired the fatal shot, but I would not be surprised if there was some other nefarious things. And for Dow Castro, I think that he's a really reliable source on the things that the CIA would do seeing as he tried to kill him at least twice that we know about and possibly <laughs> more times. So um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us once again. Um, this was something that we love talking about conspiracies. It's something that me and Jenny just, we love diving into. So thank you so much for joining us um, on this amazing Saturday. Make sure that you're following us on all our social media. Um, donate to our Patreon if you feel the urge. And, um, you know, we appreciate anything that you can give. Uh, we're on Instagram, as you know, because we're on it now, at Crime <laughs> Corruption Cocktails. We're on Twitter, at Charade Inc. That's also our YouTube channel where we republish the live stream. We also republish the podcast um, also. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we really do appreciate it. And we hope to see you soon. Yeah, before we go, I did want to say too, we are going to have new episodes out during the holidays. So if you get bored, if you're not able to see your family and really connect with other people, we'll be here for you to, <laughs> you know, chit chat. You can be like, yeah, Jen, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, Del, like that's such a good point as you're listening with us. Um, happy whatever you're celebrating or if you're not selling any, any celebrating anything around this time of year, we hope you have a beautiful end of 2020. Please stay safe everybody and we like Del said we very much appreciate all of you all right bye guys bye thank you